All right, folks, thank you all very much for being prompt uh, uh, rivals back into the room. I have a sneaking suspicion this is going to be a lot like my wedding. There'll be lots of people coming in as the, as the event unfolds, and they'll miss the best parts of, of uh, Phil's presentation here. Uh, welcome back to another joint day of uh, the uh, GEM CDAR plenary sessions. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about the, the physics of plasmas in our different regions, and we're going to kick it off with uh, Phil Erickson giving us the view of, of plasma physics from the side of the CDAR community. Thanks a lot, Mike. It, it, it reminds me, my, my parents, when they got married, had a reception, and they were supposed to get about a quarter of the hall, and when they walked in, all the barriers had been removed, and they were, the party was this tiny little blob in the middle of a vast ocean of seats. So I won't mind if you come down front. Um, might make it easier for me to see you. So um, I appreciate very much the opportunity to uh, give this presentation. Um, I understand that you know this is a Gem Cedar meeting, and we have a mixed bunch of people here. Um, so uh, this, the, the topics here, um, my title talks about cold plasma, and I'll try to define what I mean by that in a minute, because there are many kinds of plasma in the geospace system, and um, they have a fascinating amount of variety. Um, so I'm going to try to be a little tutorial here, as, as the charge indicates, and then um, I'm going to show you a couple of things I think that Hopefully we'll convince those newer to this field that there's still plenty of stuff to work on. You know, the more we look, the more we find fascinating processes out there to explore. I have to give a special thanks um, to, these are only a, a small fraction of the people that have been very gracious with their time and knowledge with me. Um, you know, uh, John Foster, who is over here, and I have to give a special uh, thanks to John. Um, not only is a mentor and a friend, but he's a, an extremely accomplished colleague and um, has had a lot of insights into these particular processes, and I've been very graciously dragged along for the ride on some of it, so hopefully I can sh share some of that with you. Um, some other people in here who are, the, are members of our Atmospheric and Geospace Sciences group at MIT Haystack, who again are a bunch of people I think who try to think about system level stuff, which is a nice bridge from Cedar to Gem. And then the fabulous pieces of what people have called the heliospheric system observatory, stuff in low Earth orbit, stuff that is not there anymore but did fundamental plasmospheric work, and the wonderfully active and Alan Probes, Themis, and MMS teams. Um, so for an outline here, um, so first of all, what do I mean by cold plasma? I'm really going to start by plasma that starts its life with energies of maybe a tenth of an electron volt to maybe a few electron volts. That's a way of sort of segmenting this vast topic here because there are fascinating things, including, for example, the warm plasma cloak, which I encourage you to go read about, which is fascinating, that might be a little bit hotter than that. And then there's stuff all the way up to relativistic energies and beyond. So as a matter of uh, a little bit of an introduction, especially for the students in the room, um, just talk about the ionosphere and some basic stuff about how it makes cold plasma, and then when you put the time derivatives in, not everything is nice and uniform. So a little bit about plasma structuring. And then I'm going to try to give just sort of three examples of the way that cold plasma, as it runs through the system, has some really fundamental uh, influences in how we think about the dynamics of what is inherently a non-local and coupled system, which is part of the reason why it's so fascinating. So. Uh, just to, uh, you know, this, this highlighting didn't show up. I was trying to sort of show you where we were in the outline. So we'll start with these couple of items here. So if you take a course, I am not a faculty member, but uh, I'm playing one on TV for the moment. Um, you know, we have this living with a star. We have this nearest neighbor that's pum pumping out an enormous amount of radiation. Yes, you can't read that in the back. But that's just sort of the 10,000 degree uh, black body radiation that the sun is putting out. And then up here is the extreme ultraviolet photons. And those guys pack a good punch. And in fact, they, when, they, when they come and they, influ uh, they illuminate our neutral atmosphere, um, they start ionizing it, making the ionosphere, which people have been looking at for a century and, and even more. And you know, if you're in a course, for example, um, one of the things you might want to do is derive well, kind of if there's no dynamics or things are relatively stable, what would that profile look like of ionization? And, um, you know, those of you who like derivations can follow along with this. And 
In addition to Roger Varney's excellent tutorial earlier in the meeting, I recommend that you, you take these and just go through them. If you haven't done it, it's really not that, not that complicated. Um, now, of course, when Chapman was doing this, uh, you know, there was some revolutionary insights in here. So, you know, you have some production function, which is basically just the density of the atmosphere you're hitting with these UV uh, photons, their cross-section, how much of the uh, energy are they intercepting, and then the flux at some particular altitude. And it turns out that, of course, the ionosphere is not completely optically thin or EUV thin. So as you get down, you get, you get depth, and, and you have to worry about the way that this production function falls off. And if you start just putting some very simple things in about solar zenith angle, you put in the absorption depth there, so the photons are getting attenuated as they go farther in, and you throw in an isothermal atmosphere, for example, and you solve this, sorry about the little bit of the blurriness there, for just what the maximum production rate is. So where is production equal to loss? And if you do that, you get this sort of height of the maximum place where the electron density should peak, and that's a function of sort of the atmospheric scale height, um, since we're talking about a, a uh, isothermal atmosphere and a couple of other constants, including that cross-section. So if you keep on going, if you, again, production equals loss, you can get down to the point that you have the Chapman function. This is the production function. This is sort of how the production of ionization varies as a function of altitude, okay? And this is what Chapman did. And if you go further, you can derive these normalized photoionization rates, very basic things, which are now as a function of um, a scaled coordinate, this is essentially dimensionless, but you can think of this as some altitude coordinate. And these various curves are for different solar zenith angles. And at some point, so there is your production function, right? And Sidney Chapman, being an extremely accomplished mathematician, among other things, just kept going and said, okay, now I'm gonna write some other simple equations. Production minus loss is gonna equal, say, the change in the ionization density. I'm gonna use Poisson's equation, and I'm gonna assume that well, the number of electrons is about equal to the number of ions. And then I get to very famous formulas where I have, there's the loss rate, for example, which is some proportional to the square of the electron density. And I can get the very classic Chapman electron density profile. So here's the ionospheric profile of some cold plasma. And by the way, those of you who had pretty good eyes and realize that my last name is Scandinavian will notice that I picked an altitude profile that is in Norwegian. Um, so thank you to my Norwegian friends. Um, so what you get is that there's a peak in something called the F region, and then there's another secondary peak at the daytime in the E region, and then there's the D region where things get complicated and a lot of the neutral chemistry takes over. So if you happen to, for example, run an observational instrument, which uh, we do at Haystack, and you run your, your radar, or if you have an ionosond, which is far older technology than that, and you just look at what, say, we'll concentrate on this, what the electron density profile is, and this is cold stuff, as you can see the temperatures here, so this is some fractions of an EV. As a function of time, so here is nominally sort of noon local time, and then here's the, the uh, nighttime hours. What you find is that you get an O plus rich plasma, which if you figure out the neutral chemistry, means that you're producing a lot of O plus. That's hot, hotter during the day, uh, more during the day, and less at night. And so this is sort of where we're starting in terms of the ionospheric production of cold plasma. And if I concentrate on this, you know, well, there's Sidney Chapman just so uh, for, for provenance here. And there's that Chapman profile function that I looked at. Um, and when I give tours, for example, at Haystack, I will point out to people that says, well, look, you know, this didn't go away at night. It actually stayed around. And if you worked out Sydney's formulas, you know, sometimes that shouldn't necessarily stay around all night, although the E region goes away, but the F region stays there. And then you can relate it back to Marconi. By the way, it says, Marconi says he sent 10,000 across the Atlantic. That's 10,000 words, you know, and the idea was that he didn't get a single word wrong. And what he's doing really is, you know, he's doing transatlantic propagation where he gets to reflect off this F layer at night, which the propagation paths are not as easy during the day. There's Tablehead in Nova Scotia, which was one of the Atlantic stations that he used to do this. So, you know, if you're in the Cedar community, and that's, that's where I, I started my work, uh, you know, this is where you... Are you, we, we spend lots of time looking in large detail at this, all right, but that's a climatology, okay? Now, if you follow this out, 
If you follow this along the magnetic field line, and you know that, for example, conservation of magnetic flux means that as you go out to magnetic field lines that stretch at longer and longer distances, you get flux tube volumes that get bigger and bigger and bigger, that ionospheric production function, which is happening down here in the closed field line portion of uh, the near, near Earth space, is gradually filling these tubes with plasma. And so, now you're into a place where the ionosphere is, is, this cold plasma is outflowing, and we call that the plasmosphere. And there's a really interesting paper way back from 1973 that Don Carpenter and Chung Park wrote on what ionospheric workers should know about the plasma cause plasmosphere. And with all the work that's been happening over the last decade, it's kind of interesting to go through that paper. But if you go in there, based on a lot of, for example, ground-based Whistler work that the Stanford group had pioneered, what you see is that you get a profile, and now this is a function of L, so for the, for the new students in the room, that's the equatorial rate crossing point of the field line in Earth radii, so L of 1 would be a field line that's right at the surface. And what you see is that if you just look at the equatorial electron density of these tubes as a function of L, oftentimes they have a, a ledge in them, which was quickly dubbed Carpenter's knee. That's why there's a little picture of a knee here. Um, and that actually turns out to be uh, often the boundary between a place where the field line is closed, where you can get plasma building up in a diffusive way, and a place where the field line is open to other processes involving high latitude um, electrodynamics, the solar wind, and that sort of stuff. But you have this cold plasma now, which is now filling a bubble around the, around the planet. And you know, back in the 60s and 70s, there was some, some thought about the morphology of this. Um, by the way, it's really difficult to see, but the guy in the middle of the picture is Don Carpenter, who apparently celebrated his 88th birthday in January 2016, and this is a member of a running group at Stanford that likes to run around the twin of the antenna I have at Millstone, so uh, it looks like Don is doing quite well and uh, happily surrounded by family there. So, cold plasma that's now not only in the ionosphere, but has flown out and, and is surrounding the planet to some distance. My, I will mention what Joe Lemaire and Bob Schunk talked about, which is that, you know, this, this sort of flow out, this was stolen from um, Roger Varney's talk. Um, there is another thing that's happening here, um, again, with this slow sort of diffusive movement along field lines. There's also something that the image mission, uh, you know, about a decade ago ran into, which is, uh, has nice data from, but was thought about before that, something called the plasmospheric wind, okay? Um, so there's a Lemaire and Chunk paper and some other uh, observational papers. If you take these equations and you just look at a place where the magnetospheric convection is very weak, okay, so weak that that boundary where maybe there's Carpenter's knee is pretty far out, it dominates to a large radial distance, you can actually get this sort of outflow, almost like the solar corona outflowing into the near nearer space, which was dubbed the plasmospheric wind. This is an actual profile from the image RPI instrument, which was uh, a radio uh, prober. And the idea was that rather than maybe a model where Carpenter's knee, I'm gonna call it, is like, like that, you can actually get these very, very gradual profiles. So sometimes the cold plasma is actually sort of going out farther than you would uh, anticipate. This is a really fascinating sort of process, so I recommend that uh, if you're interested, you, you go into more detail. There's some nice papers, including one by John and Two in 2007 about that. But it goes back to, for example, even in this paper that Carpenter had in 1973, there's this sort of ledge there. You know, it's really hard to find the boundary here, and it, 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 you know, there may be a, a, another fascinating process involved in there, again, evolving how cold plasma is flowing out. Now, all of that was, so often you, it's, got, it's a diffusive thing, it's very slowly varying, maybe if you've got a storm happens and you clean out the tubes, it's going to take some number of days to refill that. And by the way, that process, there's still active people, there's a NASA team working on plasmospheric modeling. That's never left the, the field as a very active thing with some very fascinating physics in it. But if you go to the observational record, as people were observing the ionosphere, for example, especially during storms, rather than that climatological picture I showed you, there seem to be some localized and spatial gradients in the electron, cold electron density that you could see from the ground. This is from uh, Michael Mandillo and Jack Klobuchar's paper way back in 74, 
and they had a beacon network. In those days, communication satellites were uh, linearly polarized rather than circularly polarized, typically at VHF frequencies. So you could do things like measure Faraday rotation and differential uh, Faraday, differential Doppler measurements, and you could actually use this network to sort of look at the total electron content from these four points here out to geosynchronous orbit. And when they did that after this sudden storm commencement period, you would see sometimes there would be these spatially localized, very large bumps in total electron content that were not quite the gradual, diffusive, you know, uh, behavior I showed you before. And these were labeled positive storm phase. We have, we have other labels for them now. The point was that this is beginning to be structured. So in the system, there are the unusually high but localized columnar content, alrighty. So often it would follow storm onset when things were very dynamic and there was a latitude dependence to it. So this is sort of a one-dimensional observational picture of this. And then later we had the good fortune to have the DOD spend 15 or 20 billion dollars to launch a uh, navigation satellite into orbit, which if you know that the navigation equation has to correct for the ionospheric density, uh, which causes a delay, you can back that out and you can start getting two-dimensional maps of the ionospheric total electron content, in this case over the North American content, during periods of time when, for example, uh, these sorts of things were happening. And now with a 2D snapshot, for example, as a function of time, or for example, you could take a radar and scan it from east all the way to west and just plot electron density at a fixed altitude and log scale. What you saw was two manifestations. This is sort of assuming the frozen in condition that it's sticking there for about the 10 to 15 minutes it would take to go around. Um, what you'd find is that there is in fact a two dimensional structure there of uh, you know, cold plasma enhancement in the ionosphere with pretty sharp gradients on either side. And furthermore, as we'll see, when you look at the flows in that, this was actually carrying some of the dense plasma from lower latitudes poleward toward noontime. And those of you who know about magnetospheric stuff know that the cusp at the noontime is a very intense place and a source of a lot of heating and a lot of other processes that transport plasma out. Also from radar, uh, for example, observations which do have some uh, way to tell what the composition is, we knew that that was heavy stuff. It was cold, but it was also heavy stuff. It was predominantly O+. Plus. Okay, and then as, I, as I said, combining 2D pictures, with an instruments that, for example, also measure velocity, you could track that there was some motion in place here. So lots of spatial structuring of this cold plasma. So one of the things that then we can engage, for example, the people who are modeling uh, the, uh, the overall magnetospheric system on was why was that happening, okay? And again, the answers, for example, this is the extremely famous Ejima and Patemra um, plot of storm time field aligned currents. So, and, and you gotta be careful because everybody sometimes likes to plot the sun in different ways, I've noticed. And if I tried to rotate them all to be the same way, you know, you'd all be doing this on me. So in this case, this is noontime, this is dusk, and this is midnight, and this is dawn. And, uh, you know, the black is current into the ionosphere, and the, the sort of shaded is current away from the ionosphere. And Ajima and Patemra made some labels. They said, well, this higher latitude current that, for example, is, um, upward here in the dusk sector, we're gonna call region one. And that's near, you know, that's inside where the high latitude dynamics are, are, are working. And then there's stuff below that, which is really equator word of the, the electron precipitation boundary, which we're gonna label region two. And then, you know, if you go back to Vasilinus and Dick Wolf and other people in the early 70s, um, you can realize that the reason that there are these currents flowing in and out is honestly because uh, out in some equatorial distance away from the planet, there was plasma that had, was not symmetric, for example, at storm times. It had azimuthal pressure gradients, okay? And if you invoke current continuity, Vassal Yunus makes this very simple argument that says, well, it turns out that the, the um, azimuthal pressure gradient, so in, in this case, we have more pressure and less pressure, so there's a gradient in this direction, and the fact that as we go out, the radial flux tube volume, which of course the magnetic field direction is governing a lot of things, is also getting bigger. So there's a radial uh, uh, volume gradient in one direction. And if you cross the two, it turns out that you get parallel currents that are flowing in and out of the ionosphere. And so in some sense, if I map all of this down to the ionosphere, we were getting a situation where you had current coming in 
region two, equatorward of where the electrons were precipitating, and then we had region one, which was outward current, and it turns out that there was a closure in that current through the low conductance ionosphere in this case, because a lot of this was occurring when the sun had started to turn off. And that meant that there was a potential created, and in fact, to close that current, as the conductance got, as the ionosphere got more and more insulating, you had to pump up the potential, and so you end up getting this fairly intense polar electric field in the dusk sector. And I want to advertise the fact that we do have a grand challenge session where we hope the entire CEDAR and GEM community will come and look over, look over, over all of this. It's called Sorms and Substorms Without Borders. And we're going to be talking in detail about this particular process as a very bright and significant MI coupling signature. So it turns out that this field overlaps that place where we had that density bulge happening. And so if you then scanned with a radar, I hate to keep showing radars, but what I had. Um, this is Millstone Hill back in the days of yore when the F10.7 flux was 233. Some of you who work with that, that was an interesting solar cycle. Um, so during a storm event, if you scan the radar from north to south from here in Massachusetts, this was sort of the electron density on a log scale variation. And right in here, as the plasma spheres appeared to, the cold plasma appeared to fall off to lower values, you had something which Don Carpenter and John, uh, Joe Lemaire in, in 2004 labeled the plasma sphere boundary layer. I understand boundary layer is a bit of a charged term um, in the physics community, but the point was is that they, re they realized that, that rather than just being a single me, this, was, this could be very structured because this is where energy exchange is happening. This is where cold, dense plasma is coming across hot, tenuous plasma, and there's a gradient there in energy. If you took that same scan and you instead looked at the line of sight velocity, you suddenly ran into this very intense channel of magnetically uh, uh, westward flowing stuff that was actually heading up to the noontime cusp. That's the subaural polarization stream I was mentioning. And so here you're looking at a transport agent for moving ionospheric cold plasma from places where it's larger to places where it might be able to participate in other processes. And so if you fly, for example, the DMSP satellites, which are flying along at about 840 kilometers in the topside ionosphere, and they have a very nice suite of instruments in on them, including a drift meter, which you could convert to magnetically westward. They have an ion density, for example. They have, they have the ability to tell what the, the in situ electron density was. You saw this bump, which was exactly where we saw that flowing channel in the, in the uh, uh, GPS TEC map. And overlapping it was this place where we had this potential drop and this poleward electric field as a result of this region two coupling. And so, in fact, when you took this westward thing and you, you bit it into the extra density that was cold plasma density was there, you got a fairly significant sunward cold flux moving from the inner part of the system to the outer part of the system where it could participate in other processes. If you come to the session, by the way, this afternoon, one of the things we're going to talk about is where is this located? And is it always located, for example, where there's low density, or does it sometimes uh, move in to where it can make flux? It's actually a fascinating question. I'm going to pause for a moment to tell you that, that the DMSP instrument has been really, really crucial to this community because it has a wonderful set of space weather sensors, including, for example, electron and ion part particle meters where you can, in its orbital plane, fairly regularly figure out where the equator, where the extent of electron precipitation is, and you can tell, for example, what might be subaural and what might not be. Those of you who work with DMSP might realize that there's been a little bit of a gap in data. So what I wanted to point out is that we are, in fact, working with Boston College. I have to give a gigantic shout out to NSF for funding us to be able to do this, to basically get most of the DMSP scalar data available in this particular database. See me afterward if you're interested in that. I will also mention that there's very active efforts by NOAA and UT Dallas and APL and other people. But it is important for this community because this is a, we're not paying for this to be up there, and it is important that we keep using it scientifically so that the people who take this data feed are encouraged to keep it going. We are going to have a workshop later in Boston College to, to sort of grab people. So, you know, DMSP, which is fundamental to measurements like this, is something that we really need to come together as a community and use, so I encourage that. So back to my uh, story here. So again, we've had ionospheric plasma. It's got, a, it's got a structuring agent, it's got motion, it's moving along, for example, to the high latitudes and cusp, and then, you know, there's a whole two or three or nine talks on 
outflow that happens once it gets to, for example, the noontime cusp. And there's all sorts of things that happen here. There's auroral bulk outflow. This cold plasma is being accelerated to, it is being moved to some altitude out where it's being accelerated by, again, processes that are not yet known completely. And there's a bunch of fascinating plasma physics in that alone. And people have been hacking at it and doing great things, but there's more to do there. And then you have other kinds of um, uh, more energetic processes that are sucking some of this cold plasma out and energizing it, okay? So this flow is depositing material right in the place at noontime where that can participate in ion outflow. I will also mention another thing which um, we have to talk to people about, which is that sometimes there's also, we find vertical flow even in the middle of this river, if you want to think about it, of cold plasma. So there are times when that, the base of this particular thing moves over a, a radar with a vertical ion dense um, uh, velocity measurement profile, and you can actually see 400 meters a second vertical velocity at 400 kilometers. And that's coming out of pretty dense plasma. So there's a significant amount of flux, mass flux coming out of here, and maybe some other places too, that's going to participate also in some of this ion outflow. And you know, is it heating? Is it, how does it participate in energization? I, I don't really know, but the point is that, at least from an observational point of view, it's happening. So that's another way that the community can get engaged, both modeling and observationally. So we've got a lot of cold plasma that's going into a place where it can it get accelerated and participate in outflow. Now what? All right, so if you now go out into the magnetosphere, okay, and um, you look at sort of the, the diagram. This is, again, the sun, I'll try to mention, is this way. There's the North Pole and the South Pole. Um, as Roger Varney pointed out earlier in the meeting, you do get a place where you get this thing called the ring current. So some of that energized plasma can flow out in a myriad of processes, get energized, and end up back in here. And then when the magnetic field reconfigures itself, for example, during energetic um, events like substorms and other sorts of things, you can bring that plasma in. It starts to see a magnetic force, and what it's going to do is it's going to start, the ions are going to flow one way, and the electrons are going to flow another way, and it's going to make the ring current. People have known about the ring current for a while, because if you put a magnetometer on the ground at the equator and you look at deviations, you'll notice that there is a dip in mag magnetic field measurements, which is basically this ring current going around. But as we saw with the suborbital polarization stream argument, it turns out that that's not a symmetric thing, and especially at storm times, that can get really asymmetric. So I get to shout out the extremely good work being done by Van Allen probes specifically on ring current things because you launched an instrument that has mass discrimination and fabulous ring current dynamics. So if you go to this particular diagram here by Derosé, what ends up happening is that if you look at the composition of the ring current, during quiet times, you know, it's mostly H+, plus, there's some He+, plus and a little bit of O+, plus, but during storm times, they noticed that suddenly there was a lot of heavy O+, plus there, okay? And the arguments were originally that, you know, most of this ring current was being supplied by the solar wind because it was looking like protons with some helium involved. It was really hard to argue in, in a lot of cases how that O plus got there. And so over the last, you know, two or three decades, there's been a gradual realization that a lot of this outflow and energization processes is a key supplier of heavy stuff to the ring current, and heavy stuff, if you look at your alphane formula, is going to mass load field lines more than the lighter stuff, and that's gonna fundamentally alter the electrodynamics and also particle trajectories. So this, this turned out to be a very important thing in looking at the complex dynamics of how the ring current varies. But once again, a lot of it starts with the production of that cold plasma in the ionosphere, the transport of it to a place where it can get out and participate in all of this. Um, so there's a, you know, and, and the, there's a gigantic review of geophysics in 1999. You can find Keiko had a nice paper in, in 2013 surveying what had happened in the ring current in the 14 years, and that was even before Van Allen probes. So there's a tremendous amount of interesting things you can find there. Again, we're tying it back to the life of cold plasma, and that's where it started. And then you flew missions that looked at the structure of the plasmosphere, that thing that Don Carpenter and colleagues started out by saying, well, you know, there's this diffusive process and the, the flux tubes are closed. And it turns out that, of course, every time you look at an, a, a nature, natural phenomena, you find all sorts of interesting structure. And so then there was the image mission, 
you fly an imager with a 30.4 nanometer uh, narrow wavelength filter at extreme ultraviolet, it turns out that HE plus glows. And since HE plus is a maybe 10% sometimes of the component of the plasmasphere, and since it's also an optically thin measurement, so you don't have to worry about multiple scattering too much, you can now start to make two-dimensional images as a function of time of the plasmasphere. And uh, see the rotation here, there's sun, there's midnight, there's, there's dusk, and there's noon. So what had, what had happened was, at quiet time, when the plasma maybe was a little more symmetric and a little bit like that uh, cartoon that I showed you from Don, when you started dumping energy into the system, things got interesting in a hurry. You got a, a, a sunward surge, you got an enormous amount of plasma that literally went out to the front of the plasmasphere, and then you got it actually structuring up into a plume, something that had an actual spatial extent, and then that plume, for example, would not stay in place, it would begin to rotate. So there was an inner balance between co-rotation and an electric field which was drive, a potential pattern that was driving it backwards against co-rotation. So now there was structure in the colder plasma that was surrounding the Earth, not only just down in the ionosphere. And then if you looked at, at uh, geosynchronous orbit, 6.6 .6 RE, that you know, Los Alamos was looking at for frankly, other reasons, um, you would find that this cold plasma would suddenly show up if you went back and looked for it in the data with a nice set of sensors that were arrayed in magnetic local time. So what happened maybe about 20 years ago now uh, was that someone realized that, and a guy that I, is the office down for me, kind of realized that there might be an electrodynamic connection between this particular structure we saw in the ionosphere total electron content out to about 4 RE, and stuff that was being seen by image out further. And it turns out that they are, in fact, electrodynamically connected, and so what we were seeing in the ionosphere was sort of a magnetically mapped signature of plasma flow that was forming one of these so-called plasmospheric plumes. So lots of structure, lots of gradients where, where instabilities can feed. So what we ended up with was these multi-scale views of what was happening to the cold plasma redistribution in the system, whether it was down in the ionosphere, whether it was in total electron content looking down at the top of the globe, seeing plasma fed in and all sorts of structuring, whether it was looking in the equatorial plane of the magnetosphere, making some mapping assumptions, and seeing that stuff reach out to the front of the magnetosphere, and whether we were directly imaging it with, it, with, with an uh, EUV imager. So that's been the exciting part of the last 15 or 20 years is to see this explosion of interest in cold plasma variations. There's, this, there's fascinating stuff there that, again, if you're a student, I encourage you to go look at some reviews here, and there's some good ones, and I can point you that if you'd like. Okay, so with that sort of really, really high-level overview, and I apologize to those of you who I've stepped on with making some statement that you probably realize is partially or often incorrect. Um, what I'm going to just show you is three ways now, maybe, that some of that cold plasma flow might influence geospace. And um, this is to just emphasize that there's active research going on in all of this, and that um, the sensors, in fact, we're getting more observatories in the heliospheric system observatory, and the CEDAR community is providing more and more ways, we hope, to diagnose spatial variations in the cold plasma where some of this starts its life. So when I was preparing for this talk, um, I, was, I happened to do some Google search, and I came across a very interesting paper that I said, ah, look, this, this really will address some of what I'm trying to show here. Um, and this is the title, and that is not Dan Welling, nor is that Mike Lemon. Um, but look at the title, it's a commentary. The ionospheric source of magnetospheric plasma is not a black box input for global models, and so this image came up in my mind, you know. Um, what was happening here was these, they discovered, of course, that some of this mass flow, when it goes out into the ring current, when it participates in the electrodynamics of the system, it's not a one-way thing because that cold plasma flow is going to do things like alter conductance in the ionosphere, and it's going to alter the potential signatures on its way out and even in the magnetosphere, and those are going to feed back because there are dynamic currents that are going back and forth. And you gotta do it two ways. So in fact, I'm very grateful to Dan Welling who sent me this uh, nice movie, which I'll show you in a minute, and he's also got a really excellent um, uh, summary in a Space Science Review article in 2015 that, again, he spent, I'm sure, a good portion of his year or two trying to put this together, but it's a really excellent summary of plasma sources, losses, and transport processes. 
So I, I recommend you check that out. But what we're going to see here are two simulations. This one is got a ring current, okay, that is coupled to some ionospheric outflow, but the ionospheric outflow is being treated, it treated as more or less a black box. There's some specification and it's kept fixed and we see what happens to the dynamics of the system. On the right, we're going to see when the ring current is coupled to the ionosphere magnesium, when we let currents flow both ways, okay? So the, ring two, the, the region two field line current is going to start pumping up the outflow, which is going to alter the electrodynamic conditions, which is going to feed back on the, ring, the region two current. So if I click this, uh, on the bottom, by the way, is, um, so this is IMFBZ, which is the blue curve, and the uh, green one is dynamic solar wind pressure. And uh, so noon is here, midnight is here, dusk and dawn. So let's just start this movie up. And what you see is, what you're gonna see is the percentage of O plus coming out from zero to 100%. And when we hit things like this, where we have a really bump and beat, there's a huge, huge difference in the amount of O plus that ends up out in the system. So if you just let that run a couple of times, what you can see is that this is a two-way coupling. Um, so the inherently non-local electrodynamic nature of magnetic field lines means that really we have to work together as a community to hook the specifications in one domain to the specifications in another domain and run coupled simulations to be able to accurately predict the mass loading which is going to predict the electrodynamics, which is going to predict plasma transport in the inner system during quiet and storm times. So this little example is one way that this cold plasma, which that gets accelerated in outflows, can directly impact the whole coupled MI system. Next, I want to talk about uh, just a, another brief example of when this cold plasma in that river, say that plasma spheric plume, makes it all the way to the magnetopause. So here's the plasma sphere erosion plume. Again, another image EUV. This is representative only. Sadly, image stopped talking to us about 2005. I, it would be great if it were still up. Um, but sun again this way. Here's the planet. Uh, this is, by the way, the high latitudes glowing in EUV for... Uh, I won't go into that, but the point is that, and, and by the way, it's not that there's no plasma back here, it's just that the sun is in this direction and it's kind of illuminating, so that's where you get your EUV. There's that plasmosphere drainage plume that I showed you in um, some other pictures. And now, for example, you can fly a low altitude spacecraft or say a radar down here in the ionosphere and you can gauge the flux. And better yet, you can also fly in situ centers like Themis, like RBSP, even MMS. MMS flies into the inner magnetosphere just fine, and thankfully they leave the plasma sensors on, so you can actually do that measurement as well. Um, you can fly through this and gauge the flux. And it turns out if you gauge the flux down in the ionosphere, say about 800 kilometers, uh, maybe about here, and then you actually then fly through it at altitude, this is sort of the ionospheric view of the plasma circulation that's happening. This plume is going like this and then wrapping around going back and completing a circuit, you, know, you can measure the flux in situ, alrighty? And what you find out is that flux is quite large. Um, it turns out that there's, you know, one to, times 10 to the 12th per meter squared per second happening out here, and there's two to times 10 to the 13th at DMSP, and those of you who have ever done ion flow, flow things, those are pretty significant numbers, and it turns out if you just integrate that up across the, the, the plasma, you're talking about five times 10 to the 25th ions per second. That's enough to actually remove most of the plasma in about one RE shell off the plasmosphere in about an hour. So this is a really, really significant amount of mass transport. Um, by the way, uh, that number shows up at other planets as well. I am not a planetary atmosphere or a magnetosphere person, but there's definitely some scaling laws that are working there because you can actually come up with that number in other places. So. Yet another fascinating thing for, for example, a budding graduate student to look into. Um, so this is a nice little diagram from Joe Borofsky. Again, schematically, maybe this is quiet time and there's the, the quiet plasmosphere and then you get this drainage plume. So that's heavy mass going right to a place where we know there's all sorts of magnetic field reconnection and all sorts of energy input from the solar wind. So in fact, Joe has this very nice quote that basically says the magnet, you know, the, mag the, the sun pushes harder on the magnetosphere to try to put energy in there and the system fights back. 
So the only reason I put this down here to say is that the first rule of Fight Club is you never talk about Fight Club. So maybe I'm violating that rule by actually talking about this thing fighting back, but it does, all right? Maybe I should have paid royalties for that. Uh, anyways, so what Brian Walsh and other people and Joe Borofsky and Mick Denton and other people noticed, for example, Borofsky and Denton back in 2006, is that if you did a statistical study of just the, the rate of energy coupling at the solar wind front, what you notice is that when you have active times, there's the KP index, as imperfect as it is. Um, when you had, for example, plasma coming within two hours of local noon, so some nominal place where the magnetopause was happening, when ended up, you got, you know, in those numbers of data sets, what you ended up happening was is that you could measure a drop in sort of the amount of energy input generally. So the idea was that maybe the presence of that dense cold plasma is one way to reduce the solar wind magnetosphere coupling and maybe there's a negative feedback um, mechanism in here, which, you know, there's a lot of those throughout nature. Maybe here's a good one. And so if we go back to the ionosphere and we look at polar cap uh, two-dimensional snapshots as a function of time, when all of that cold plasma had come up here, again, think of the plasmospheric plume out there in the magnetosphere, and it went through the cusp. There are people who study polar cap patches, the way this material kind of sometimes becomes patchy, sometimes becomes a little more continuous up here, and so the thought had occurred uh, to Brian Walsh and other people, you know, is, are we seeing now something in the ionosphere that tells us something about reconnection processes and the rate of energy input at the front there? And in a nice coincidence, I remember Brian and John being at a table at AGU, and, and one of them said, you know, look at, this, look at this configuration here. Boy, Themis is flying right through the place where this plume seems to be coming out. This is, by the way, the plume projected out into, into coordinates. One note, by the way, for these kinds of maps, those of you who may have seen these, Sometimes, you know, you say, well, well wait a minute, you know, the, the, uh, the GPS cluster is orbiting at four Earth radii. How are you mapping this thing out to eight Earth radii? Well, I I'm not claiming that the GPS TEC map is a one-for-one -one gauge of the actual cold plasma density there, but what we try to do is we try to just say that the boundaries of that particular plume are the things that tend to map nicely in a magnetic sense. So in some sense, while I, I'm not going to give you any, um, what the dynamics that we see, the variations in these pixels are really driven by ionospheric variations, but the point is that the, the, it's a good snapshot of where the boundaries are for that plume. And so, oh look, you, you ran through it with three Themis satellites, which are again nicely well equipped, so what happens? And again, those of you who wanted to stay back where the cameras are, you're not going to be able to read any of this part. I'll zoom, blow one of them up in a minute. But the study found that as Themis came along out of the magnetosheath into the magnetosphere, what they saw was a large jump in the amount of electron density, essentially the amount of coal electrons uh, that the spacecraft was encountering. And, you know, Themis D saw it, Themis E saw it, Themis A saw it as it went through. And if you then just blow up one of those guys, what you see is that there's the magnetosphere side of things. Normally this density would be less, but the plume kind of pumped it up. And when it did that, what you notice is that things called reconnection jets, Brian will be, Walsh will be giving a talk after me, so um, I'm not going to go into the details because I just embarrassed myself there. But this re reconnection jet, because of this asymmetric density, seems to be displaced a little bit into the magnetosheath, which is going to alter the rate of energy input there. And um, you can see that because, you know, BL here in this coordinate system is the way I'm marking where the magnetosheath and the magnetosphere is, and that thing is displaced. So the nice thing here is that maybe if that's the case, one could take these ground maps of total electron content, and although, again, the quantitative details are, you know, whether something is 20% or more or less, you can at least look at the boundary and maybe some of this patchiness has to do with some of the dynamics of reconnection at the front of the magnetosphere. So another active area of research that I think is quite fascinating. So finally, to grab the gem folks in here who have been sitting there scratching their heads and looking at all this wonderful radiation belt data, it turns out that there's cold plasma stuff to think about even in there. So I put up Dr. Van Allen up here in Iowa, 
And there's one of the lovely uh, sort of nominal profiles of the inner and the outer radiation belts, which we now know from the, uh, the Van Allen probes mission have sometimes a lot of structure. And here they are zipping around in and out uh, up to about five to six RE. And you know, here's the, the, the inner proton belt, of course, is very stable. This is cosmic ray albedo neutron decay. And you, know, you get 100 plus MeV protons in there. But the outer belt is the thing that can be highly variable, stuff from tens of EV all the way out to MeV plus. And so there's been a lot of work looking at this boundary and how that sort of thing that varies. Um, I'm, Roger went through some of this. OK, I'm just putting the slide up so that later the students can go in and grab this and take a look is that when you're out in the magnetosphere, you know, there are typically three invariants that people try to sort the, the, the motion by, one of which is the gyro motion, that's the first invariant. The second one is the bounce motion from hemisphere to hemisphere. And the third one is the fact that there's a B cross delta grad B force that's slowly making these guys drift around. All right, um, and that's altering. There's a, there's, a, there's a relationship between the parallel velocity and the perpendicular velocity of these particles, but there are things that can interact with these particles that can change that, and if you put enough parallel velocity in, you can knock these guys into the atmosphere, so that's part of radiation belt dynamics. So this stuff is going on, but as there's voluminous papers, and if you go to Van Allen probes working sessions, there's you know, whole days devoted to this, is that there's a tremendous number of discrete waves out in the magnetosphere that get to interact with all of these particles, like the ring current particles, like the higher energy particles, and do things like change their trajectories. And there's a whole zoo of them, okay, I won't talk about any of these guys in detail, but the resonance conditions between those waves, some of which are very significantly altering the trajectories, and the actual particle at a given energy not only depend on the energy, but they can sometimes depend on the ambient background plasma. And we just saw that there can be a lot of variation in that lower energy plasma out at regions where it matters to these wave particle interactions. So if you looked at, for example, one of the things that tends to happen is that people looked at diffusion, you know, quasi-linear diffusion. So in other words, you set up a radiation belt and it turns out that, you know, lions and thorn, and this was from a gem tutorial a ways back, um, it turns out if you just look at the, the diffusion, uh, you know, rate of transport of this, this uh, material slowly inward as a function of L, this scale is on days and it's a log scale, it turns out that, you know, there are processes that very slowly reconfigure what's going on in the belts, but they can take a long time, I mean, hundreds of days to thousands of days, um, at least for these particular limited set of processes. Um, so the ones that actually get kind of into the inner edge of the outer belt, they can have lifetimes of years if these are the processes that are always occurring, okay? And you'll notice that some of these curves cross. This is, for example, um, wave sort of uh, uh, time constants for adiabatic diffusion and pitch angle diffusion and transport. This is, for example, um, Coulomb collision transport, and this guy is just the diffusion inwards. You'll notice that these curves cross about L of 2.5 to 2.8 for this particularly low set of energies. Well, it turned out that the days part, quickly the Van Allen probes project, uh, when people examined the dynamics of the radiation belt, realized that the inner edge of the outer belt was doing dynamics that were all over the place. And in fact, those dynamics increased in minutes sometimes, not days. And, um, I, you, and they were happening precisely where you saw wave activity. So this started to make one think about, well, is there, are there resonance conditions with other waves in here that are being altered by the cold plasma relations? Let's take a look. By the way, this is Dan Baker's very famous paper uh, in addition to the third belt. They, they, he noticed that if you plotted data over three years, this is a function of radial distance and time, there was this sort of asymptote at about 2.8 Earth radii where nothing ever seemed to really come in, at least in the, the records that you had. And so the word impenetrable barrier was coined. And then the MIT press office got a hold of it and other people got a hold of it. And so, you know, now we have a Star Trek-like force field surrounding Earth. And I'm very thankful for the invisible belt that saves Earth from radiation. Mm. Um, but they tried. Um, so if you looked at the fluxes, again, here's this impenetrable barrier at about 2.8 Earth radii, and it turned out that there may have been a relation to where the cold plasma was. Specifically, it turned out that what we figured out was that at that time, 
The inner edge of this belt was not where the plasma pause was. So in other words, it, this belt wasn't coming up just to the outer plasma pause and not coming in. It turned out that the plasma pause during that particular time went all the way down to two Earth radii, but the particles never came any closer than about 2.8. And, and, and that's where the artist got you know, these sorts of things from. So the question was, could we think about why? We have a paper that's just out, and again, this is very preliminary, and Jay Albert and other people are, are thinking about this, but there is something else that's happening out there, which is that we as humans have been broadcasting for decades very, very powerful VLF transmitters that are going and filling, almost in a bubble, the inner magnetosphere uh, because we like to communicate with submarines. Um, and it turns out that some of the wave, uh, and you can actually see these discrete transmitters if you fly a, a wave instrument through there. And some of these wave intensities are huge, all right? Like, in fact, there's one of the facilities. This is the Washington Monument for scale. Um, and the power density is quite good, and some of these guys pump a megawatt CW out. In fact, the NAA transmitter in Cutler, Maine is just screaming away at very low frequencies. And so the question was, uh, uh, 20, 30 years, even more ago, some people said, does that resonate with these, these MeV particles? Could that be doing something about the radiation belt? And there were some calculations that went on, and there's this nice paper by Abel Thorne that basically says, not really. The VLF frequencies are the wrong ones to resonantly interact with the radiation belt particles. But they used an ambient density inside the plasmasphere. And so what we may have found there was a case where, the plasmosphere, where that, that particular VLF bubble got exposed briefly by the fact that the plasmasphere, all the cold plasma, had run inward. And um, in fact, this is, by the way, how intense that transmitter frequency is. It's, a, it's, an, it's 10 to the fifth increase. It's a huge amount of electric field out there. When you looked very carefully, when that plasma pause went inside the place where, where normally you know, the inner edge of the belt was, there was all sorts of stimulated Whistler wave growth. And so all of you gem people will, of course, recognize that whistlers are really good at pitch angle scattering things into the atmosphere. Um, so there was a, well, I understand that the resonance condition doesn't work, but during this particular case, wow, look at all this wave power. And it turns out that if you look at the cyclotron resonance for relativistic particles, you know, you have, there's a dependence, for example, on the pitch angle and energy but if you look at how the waves are propagating along, there's a direct dependence, of course, on the, the, the electron plasma density, the cold plasma density, and the wave normal angle. That's how you determine what the roots of the equation are. And so what a few people realized was that if you actually do the resonant energy calculations as a function of distance, when the plasmasphere retreats, so when the plasmasphere sort of goes from this dotted line here to this line here, suddenly the resonant equations change. And right at about 2.8 Earth radii, these very strong VLF signals are suddenly resonant with ultra-relativistic electrons at a certain pitch angle. And so suddenly what we figured out was maybe there was a way under certain conditions that the cold plasma and its dynamics could in fact even have a direct impact on stuff that was at a million electron volts or more, highly relativistic particles. So, Next to last slide, there was just this cartoon that, and again, this is a special, perhaps, case. It might only occur, but in storm times, when that plasma pause comes way in, I, I, you know, it's closer than the edge of this particular bubble that we're, we're putting out there with VLF transmissions, very, very powerful, there they are. Maybe there's a case where the MEV electrons can sort of run into this, somebody called it an electric fence, or something like that, and that might greatly enhance a pitch angle scattering and dumping of the, the particles. It may help to shape the inner edge of the outer belt. So even those people who were, have been doing radiation belt stuff, we've begun to realize that understanding the whole system, understanding the cold plasma, how it gets energized and how it gets transported, can even have a fundamental effect on energies that you didn't think really needed to worry about them. So, just to summarize, there are a lot of cold plasma sources in the ionosphere. They're large, they have significant mass flux. We know that they are spatially asymmetric, and we know that they are transported not only in the ionosphere, but out into the plasmasphere and into geospace, into regions where we have a lot of energy input into this system. And so I would assert that one of the things that we're learning in the last decade is that cold plasma influence on these fundamental processes is really significant. 
So I think it's really good that we have a joint Cedar Jam meeting here where people can go back and forth and work together and try to attack this very challenging problem, one of the more challenging in classical physics and even uh, relativistic physics because everything's coupled, honestly, on some scale to everything else. So with that, I'm very appreciative of your attention and thank you very much.